Today, we have the privilege and, and the honor to visit with John Curran. He's a former prisoner of war, American prisoner of war in Europe. His home is in Grafton, and he's uh, had a varied career, both before the service, during the service, and after. And now we're going to have John tell us about your life. And first, we want to know uh, who your folks were, and where you were born, and how old you are, and so on. Just go okay. right ahead and tell us these uh, things. My uh, parents are the children of pioneers in Walsh County. My uh, dad's father was Timothy Curran, and he settled on land northeast of Minto. He was a farmer. And uh, my dad was born and raised there. He went to work for the Railway Mail Service, and he traveled about North Dakota on mail cars, and eventually he was reassigned to uh, St. Paul, which was regional headquarters and operator out of there. My mother is also a daughter of uh, a pioneer, Simon Relic, Simon Relic and his wife. And uh, she studied nursing. And was that right? Like, was that the store? Was that the that was her, my grandfather's brother? I see. Oh, I see. And then uh, she became a nurse, and she uh, worked in uh, Devil's Lake. Uh, my uh, parents uh, became engaged. My dad was in Saint Paul. My mother was in Devil's Lake. And then uh, when they were married in 1923. Uh, they, after that, they settled in St. Paul where my dad uh, worked. And, um, uh, now, your dad worked in this uh, post office, uh, yeah, railway post office? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's and sorted mail, right? Railway mail service. He used to go on uh, trains. They sort mail on the train, drop it off here, pick it up. And, uh, and they then they had a central place in St. Paul there that they... Uh, yeah, that's the regional headquarters. That's, I see. That's where the... Uh, much of the mail was distributed, uh, sorted yeah, out, distributed. Sure. And um, my dad worked there for, oh, must be over 30 years, and he retired from there. He was uh, an active member of the American Legion, and as soon as I got out of the service, I joined the American Legion, joined the same post that he belonged to. Where was that at? Uh, St. Paul. St. Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. There used to be a separate post for really uh, male uh, personnel. I see. And he was in that organization. Sure. Then... Uh, when they, they they were married, and then, then where were you born? When? Okay, I was born in St. Paul. My dad, uh, uh, before my parents were married, my dad had been transferred to St. Paul. So my uh, mother had to leave Devil's Lake and uh, settle in St. Paul. And uh, in my family, there was a brother and a sister. And uh, I was the oldest of the three children. You had a brother and a sister in yeah. South three yeah. mm -hmm. in St. Paul. It's old St. Paul. Now, where'd you go to school? I went to school, grade school in St. Paul, high school in St. Paul, and I went to Hamlin University also in St. Paul. I uh, uh, also, after graduating from Hamlin University, I had worked for about a year and then uh, went out to uh, Colorado and got my master's degree uh, in economics at the University of Colorado. You were out there alone. You weren't married now then? No, no, no. no. Was it now before the war or? After the war. After World War. Okay. Mm -hmm. Say, tell me, what did you, how did you get into the war? Were you drafted or volunteered? No, no. Or? Uh, at that time, it was possible to enlist in uh, the Army Air Corps, which is the forerunner of the uh, Air, U.S. Air Force. And I uh, enlisted. They had more people than they could handle in basic training. I listened in November of, uh, of 42, and wasn't called up until uh, uh, February, uh, 1st of February of 43, when they had openings for basic training. And I went through basic training at uh, uh, the Jefferson Barracks south of St. Louis, Missouri. How, how far, is that along the river there? Yeah, it's along the river. That is where you took your basic training? That's where the basic training what, was. What, what did you do in basic training? What kind of training would you have there? Well, you learn how to march and uh, shoot a rifle and no no we didn't get any shooting there we didn't there no that wasn't until later on oh but uh we had basic training there learning military discipline more or less i see and then uh, being able to handle yourself correctly you had a classroom work there too or most of it outside in most the of it was outside 
reading a compass and yeah. mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? I was in Jefferson Barracks for maybe about six weeks. Yeah. Where'd you go then? And then I went to uh, Beloit University in Beloit, Wisconsin. And, uh, Is that there, run by the Air Force now? Or? Was, it was part of an Air Force program to train Air Force personnel. Yeah. And then after th that, I was there oh, maybe about two and a half months. Then we were sent by train from uh, Beloit, Wisconsin to uh, Santa Ana, California. And that's where we got our real uh, Air Force training. That was that. Now at, at Beloit, there. What did you do? Just to have uh, mathematics and English and so on? Or? Yeah. Well, you had you know uh, you had training in the, the subjects that would be of uh, use to us as a member of the Air Force. Oh, I see. Now and then you went to Santa Ana. Yeah. That was a big camp in Very Southern California. Mm -hmm. What did you do there? Well, we had uh, you know uh, uh, more uh, training there but training and uh, uh, some of the military skills that we'd need in the future. And uh, it was a large camp, and like one of the things we had to learn there is like, for example, if you had a, a parachute from an airplane, how to do it correctly. If you had a, a land in the water, how to do that correctly. And, and that's just these, an example. These are the things that they you taught you at Santa yeah, Ana. This was, now, how many were there there at Santa Ana were with you? Was there a hundred or a thousand? Or? Uh, well, in my barracks I was in, there must have been uh, maybe a hundred personnel, but, you know, I don't know. There were a lot of barracks there. Yeah, so sure. There, there, I'm sure there were about thousands. Now, did you know uh, what you were going to do when you got uh, after finished this training? Or Yeah. Uh, the... Uh, during, the, uh, you know, decision was made at Santa Ana or what I'd be doing in the future. And uh, the, de the decision was that I would be a navigator. And I uh, then r right after finishing Santa Ana, I went to uh, uh, the uh, Las Vegas uh, Air Base, which is now Nellis Air Base. And we had in, training in there, Nevada. gunnery training. Oh, gunnery training. Gunnery yeah. training. Uh, that is flexible gunnery training, what they called, or aerial gunnery training? Uh, aerial gunnery, but uh, actually most of this was on the ground. Yeah. And uh, the, at, at Las Vegas, we learned how to dismantle uh, uh, a, a machine gun, put it together again. We had to do this blindfold. That was one of our tests. Oh, yeah. Sure. And uh, uh, after Las Vegas, I went to... Uh, uh, Hondo, Hondo uh, Air Base in Texas is 40 miles west of San Antonio. This is for training as a navigator. I didn't make it, so I was reassigned to uh, Buckley Field in Colorado. And then it was decided... That's just outside of Denver, isn't it? Yeah. East mm -hmm. of Denver, okay. And then uh, from there... This, yeah, uh, as a gunner, no. Uh, I was going to be a gunner, but yeah. I was only in Buckley Field maybe about a month or so oh. until they decide where I was supposed to go. Oh. And I went to... Uh, uh, Salt Lake City. I was there for a short period of time, and their decision was made to send me to uh, the Rapid City Air Base, uh, outside of Rapid City, South Dakota, and that's where we had our flying training as uh, gunnery. You were personal. on a big plane now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind? Uh, well, just two engine, twin engine, I suppose. Uh, two, a twin engine, yeah. Yeah, Beechcraft. Okay, yeah. go ahead. And then that's we had a gunnery training, and also we traveled about. Uh, South Dakota, Nebraska, and looking at various targets. Yeah. And uh, after finishing, uh, uh, I was assigned to a, a crew in Rapid City. And uh, we. A regular we, aircraft crew with yeah, pilot, ten, ten pilot. personnel, and we had flight training together. And once that was over, we were sent to Kearney, Nebraska, where we were assigned an aircraft. It was a B 17, and we flew the aircraft. That's like a plane like this here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from uh, Kearney, Nebraska, we flew overseas. We flew from uh, uh, Kearney to uh, Delfield in Maine. Now, yeah. were there many? Were there, was this a group of planes, or were you alone? Well, just our own. Uh, we. You were a replacement, or were you part a, of a group? A replacement. A replacement. Yes. So we traveled, you know, by ourselves in this yeah. one plane. Uh, there may have been others too. I don't remember, yeah. but uh, we went by plane from. Uh, uh, Dalfield of Maine to New Gander, Newfoundland to uh, Legion's Airfield in the Azor Islands. Now this is you're going to, you're going overseas, over the North Atlantic now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
but our goal was to uh, be re uh, reassigned in southern Italy, the, yeah. the, t uh, the second air group. Yeah. Kind of funny they didn't send you the southern route then, but that is beside the point. I oh, guess. I mean through Brazil? Yeah. I don't know. The no. uh, well, you no one. Would well, we know we we uh, you couldn't make it across Atlantic without a stop. So we stopped in the Azores and uh, in Morocco, Tunisia, yeah. and then we ended f up from there. We ended in southern Italy. So, so now was this your permanent base in Italy? Or yeah. Are you? Southern where Italy. Go? The f I was with the Fifteenth uh, Air Force in southern Italy. Yeah, that's yeah. a bomber group now. Yeah, second bomb group. Yeah. And that was your your station then that you flew out of. Yeah, we flew out of uh, Southern Italy. And we were, we what kind flew. of facilities did you have there at that uh, base there in Italy? Well, we had uh, hutment, which is like wooden sides and a, con a canvas top. Yeah. And uh, Southern Italy, the climate was warm, yeah. and uh, so it didn't it didn't matter that we're no. more or less open. What time of the year was that now when you got down? I to got Italy? there in, uh, around. Uh, Shortly after the Fourth of July. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Of forty. Of forty-four. Forty-four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, did you start flying missions after that? Uh? Yeah. And as soon as we got there, we started flying, and our missions covered southern Europe, from southern France through central Europe, off to into Romania. Now, how many planes were you in a group or a squadron that you flew? Well, we, I was in the twentieth uh, squadron, second air group. I see. And usually, the squadron flew together. Now, what were some of the targets of the, that you flew? All right, uh, uh, there was an invasion of southern France in August of '44 on the 15th of August. We flew there to support that. Uh, other targets were in uh, southern Germany, Austria, Hungary. Uh, one of our targets was the oil fields in Romania. The Germans depend upon oil. And also we flew from there uh, north to uh, Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and uh, southern Germany. Now, your base had moved further north then by that time, hadn't it? Well, no. No, we stayed at the same you location. You still make that uh, yeah. Poland from uh, Italy? But, yeah, from Italy. Pretty long haul. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, we used to have uh, aircraft support in our missions, yeah. in our uh, combat... Uh, fighter uh, support. Fighter squadron. But the, the fighter squadron could not make it to... Uh, distant places no. like uh, Poland and uh, the Czech Republic and so forth. So uh, we were on our own then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how many how many missions did you fly a total of? Uh, 21. 21. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were shot. Now, what kind of uh, enemy uh, resistance did you get on most of those missions? The most of the missions was uh, flak. Was flak from the and ground. From the ground. And the aircraft. And they, it very seldom we saw any uh, a German fighter planes. No. But on the uh, last mission I was on, our target was uh, a munitions factory at uh, Blackhammer in the northeastern part of the Czech Republic. What's uh, the name uh, of the place? Blackhammer. Blackhammer. That is the northeastern? Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I speak of, you know, like uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and so forth. Yeah. This was all uh, German yeah. at oh, the yeah. time. Yeah. And uh, on this last mission, uh, I was shot down over what is now Slovakia. Picked up right away because we landed near a German barracks. Uh, How high were you then? Uh, what, what, what made you go down? Or what made you? We were hit by an ME 109 fighter, and uh, the plane hit the aircraft, and we were told to bail out. And uh, the uh, the bombardier navigator and I were up on the nose part of the plane, we, so we got out. The pilot got off. The rest of the crew went down. The plane were died. They couldn't get out, or had they been the, the injured? Well, I know the co-pilot was hit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the engine. I, mean, I think it was the engineer was hit. Yeah. I knew that, so he was probably not conditioned to be able to get out. No. And the rest of the crew just didn't make it. You don't know. No. no. What about the pilot? The pilot did get out. Did get out. Now, did you all jump out about the same time? At about what altitude were you? Uh, about 20,000 feet. Yeah. And our instructions were, when you bail out, don't pull the ripcord until you're about a, a couple thousand feet above the uh, ground. This is to be being shot at from uh, by fighter uh, well, aircraft. Did you did you have a backpack or a chest pack? A chest pack. Chest pack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, 
That was a B-17? B-17, yes. How many planes were shot down that day as far as you know? I think? don't know. No. Uh, there was a friend of mine that was in a different aircraft, and I found out after the end of the war that he was also shot down the same day. I see. But altogether, I don't know how many planes yeah. were shot down. You know, an interesting uh, sidelight just for a second was, it was 55 years ago today that I was shot down over Germany. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Well, that's in Germany, were you then? Frankfurt. Oh, Frankfurt. Yeah, but that's, that, I mean, we're not telling my story now. We want to find yours, John. <laughs> yours is more interesting. Uh, you, uh, you got shot down by this, by this German school, German uh, military school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happened then? Okay, well, I landed near German barracks. I was, uh, I got my first lesson in German. I was told, Hände hoch, which means hands up. So, uh. I was hauled off to a local jail. Now, were the other were those other crew members? No, I was alone. You were alone. alone. I was alone. Were you injured? No, no. And you went to this jail. Then what happened? I, I was in the jail for about a day or so, put on a train, and sent with other uh, POWs to Vienna. We spent a night there. Then we're put on a different train. We went to uh, uh, the Dulag Luft, which is a camp which decides where the POWs would be placed. Yeah, that's uh, by Frankfurt. Yeah, by Frank that's, North of Frankfurt. That's quite a ways up there that you had to go on train then, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many were there in your group that went up there? I mean, 10 I, or 50 or 100? I, or I, I'd say when we were in Vienna, I think there must have been about 20 of us. Yeah. Uh, then uh, we're split up, you know, as soon as we arrived in uh, Wetzlar, we immediately put into uh, a cell uh, by, our uh, by ourselves, so I never did s see what happened to the rest of them. No. And then uh, uh, the decision, uh, I did, we did get out one time, there was a formation of some kind, and then I found out the uh, the bombardier navigator on our plane got out, and I did see him, so I knew he was safe. Sure. And uh, then we were separated because he uh, was an officer and he went to the uh, uh, peer to be a camp for officers. The, the, where your place depend upon your military rank. If you're an enlisted man, you probably ended up at uh, uh, working as slave labor on a farm in, uh, in Germany. I was a non-commissioned officer, so I went to a place called uh, uh, Stalag Luft Number 4. Where was that at? Uh, that was located between Stettin and uh, Danzig, and North, what used to be northeastern Germany. It's now in Poland. Now, uh, how did you get there? Train. How many were there of you that went then? Uh, how many were with me then? I mean, was it a I, I think the most hundred or so? Or? Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it saved me at least 25, I think. Yeah. I think. You took a train then to... Uh, we took a train. We got off at the railroad station uh, at Kiefheide, and the camp was actually located at another place called Gross Tisho. Oh, yeah. And uh, there was uh, were assigned to this camp. The camp was large. It had four compounds, uh, each one holding about uh, 2,000 POWs. Americans now. American. Well, uh, th there was one one of these units of uh, British uh, POWs, see. but uh, the compound I was in, they're all Americans. Were those buildings built on the ground, or were they on stilts? It was a barrack. Was on t stilts. Stilts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how? When you what what happened? How did you get there? Can you tell me what happened as you walked in there, uh, into this camp? The only thing I can remember is we walked in there and were assigned to a particular room. Yeah. And uh, I got to meet some of the people that were there before. At the time I arrived there, there were only about twenty in the room. Yeah. But uh, the room was bare. We slept on a straw mattress. The only thing there was the uh, coal stove. You needed the coal stove for warmth in the winter time. And uh, there, in each barracks, must have had about oh, a dozen of these rooms. These uh, rooms were built to hold maybe about 20 people. And as the war went on and there were more POWs were captured, uh, we ended up with 26 in this room. So it covered just about every inch of space on the floor. Sure. Now, how did how did the Germans treat you at this place at this camp? Uh, the 
uh, the, uh, tr the guards in this camp were middle-aged men, and uh, they treated us very leniently. They, apparently, they were aware that Germany was losing the war, yeah. so they were not out to mistreat us. No. Uh, the, the food uh, ration was, uh, we had a cup of chicory for breakfast. Chicory is a substitute for coffee. During the war, the Germans could, didn't have access to coffee-producing countries, so uh, we had chicory for a cup for chicory for breakfast. What is this chicory kind of a? Uh, the, the, it's used in uh, New Orleans, oh. as, um, but uh, chicory is something like oh, herbal tea or something oh, like I that. Yeah. Uh, it's not very popular. You never see it sold, no. it sold in restaurants around here. No. And then uh, uh, lunch consisted of a uh, watery soup. Once in a while, maybe you can see a little piece of meat in it. <laughs> uh, then uh, and the evening supper was a cup of uh, potatoes. We had a job of peeling potatoes. There was a, a, a central kitchen in uh, kitchen where they prepared the potatoes. Then they sent the food to the barracks. Did you have that job then, uh, regularly, every day of peeling potatoes? I don't know how, how many times a day, uh, how often oh. during the week I went there. But anyway, we had the job of peeling potatoes. And For all the, uh, all the barracks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the food was rationed and so much going to each uh, barracks and room. Sure. And uh, the only way we could survive is uh, we had one other ration we had was uh, 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 rye bread. This was very heavy, yeah. and, and not like American bread. No. You had to pick up a loaf and weighed about two pounds, maybe. Yeah. And uh, we originally were given about half a loaf a week. Yeah. Some people <coughs> call that black bread. Kind yeah, of that's black it. bread. And then uh, as the time went on, they, apparently there were shortages of bread, so at the end maybe we'd get about six of a loaf of uh, bread a week. Yeah. In addition, we got uh, Red Cross parcels, these were rationed originally. We get maybe one parcel for maybe two weeks or so, and as transportation became more difficult, it was harder to bring them uh, across parcels in from Sweden. So at the end, we got very little. Did all the men lose weight then when they were in camp there? Sure did. Yeah. What uh, What about sickness? Were there many guys that got sick or? Uh, no, in the. Well, I can't say, because in the barracks I was in, I wasn't aware of anyone that was uh, uh, taken out. Yeah. But I knew t uh, if you became seriously ill, the Germans took you out and put you in a, a hospital or someplace, some other place. It was I not mean, in the you camp. You didn't know where they were. No, I don't know where they went. Did you have any, did you have a doctor there or, or dental or anything like no, that? No, nothing like that. No. Uh, uh, the only... Uh, uh, one uh, uh, one uh, feature of our of our camp was as unusual though. There was a uh, uh, British uh, clergyman who was uh, had uh, religious services on Sunday. I see. And uh, was that for the whole camp or just as? Well, he, he he was a Catholic, so he used Catholic services. Yeah. But uh, he, I think, it must have been in that uh, other camp here where the British were. But they let him come into our camp on Sundays. Oh, yeah. So that was the extent mm -hmm. of your, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, besides the, that care, that minimum care that you, you could receive, or that, that was, now he was, he was a clergyman. He was, he'd been captured, that Roman Catholic yeah. priest. Mm -hmm. thing, yeah. Now, did you, did you, what kind of activities did you have in the camp itself? Did you all have, right. Uh, all right, if you wanted recreation, you could walk around the camp. Yeah. And, uh, those that wanted to could play a little football. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but most of the activity just walking around the camp. And uh, we did have books we could read. Did you get any letters from home? No. Did you wrote some letters? Well, I was able to write letters, and my parents told me later on they did receive the letters. They yeah. sent letters to me, also pa uh, packages. Yeah. Received none of this. No. Now, in that room where you lived there mm -hmm. was these 20 guys, some guys. Uh, how did the guys get along with each other? Pretty good. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. You never had any fights or anything? Oh, once in a while there'd be a fight, but yeah. uh, in most cases we got along pretty well. 
Did you have? Did you play cards or anything at night? Or yeah, we play cards too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what did they? What did they talk about there? Those guys, just food, I suppose, or oh, we talk about home and uh, our experiences. Yeah. And uh, I got to meet a variety of people. Like uh, uh, in the room where I was in, there was one man who was originally from Ireland. He came to the states and enlisted in the. Army Air Corps, so he could become a citizen. Of course, sure. he got in the Air Force and he was shot down. Yeah. And another one was uh, from Boston. Uh, one I remember particularly well is Doug Rice. Uh, he was a young man from South Carolina, and he liked to play football. And I often wondered, you know, what happened to him. I never heard anything more. No. Now, how long were you in this particular camp? We was th I was there from uh, September. Till early Fe or September forty four to early February forty five. Now it was it was so called winter then. Yeah. Was there snow on the ground? Or oh, snow, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then what did what happened then? Did you when you left there? How did you? What was the c conditions? There. Well, the in early February the Germans realized the Russians were coming, so uh, coming from the east. From the east, so the evacuees put us on a train that took us across the Oder River. And the other side of the Oda River, we had to get out and, and walk. So we walked from uh, near Stettin to uh, around through what later became East Germany. Sure. And then ended up in uh, Saxony, which is uh, well, the southern, or used to be the southern part of East Germany. And we, uh, uh, the Walking was a very enlightening experience for me because I got out and got to see how the people were were uh, were living. Like the Germans depended a lot upon slave labor, and you'd see people wearing jackets or shirts with the letter P on it. This means they were Polish slave laborers. Another letter you'd see is O, and O would be uh, these were people from the Baltic countries that were also used as slave labor, but the Germans did this to make sure that nobody could mistake them for being German. I see, yeah. But they used, you know, most of the German men were in the service, so they need, uh, needed these slave laborers to operate their farms and factories. Yeah. And they, they, I, communal, communal farms in the sense, I suppose. Well, no, they weren't communal. I, oh. mean, I don't think they were communal no. farms. I think they were Just still privately farm, yeah. owned. But uh, I remember we'd, we'd spend, and walk in, we'd walk maybe, maybe 40 kilometers a day End up in a f uh, farmhouse someplace, or sleep in the in the barn. At one of these places, I met a, a young girl. She looked as if she'd be about seven years old, and I talked to her. And she said she was Polish. She was actually 12 years old. I asked her, "How about uh, if you go to school?" And she said, "No, as a Pole, she couldn't go to school." I but see. these were the kind of people that they had on the uh, the farms. What about the what about the eating? And now you said 40 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Now how far is that in miles? About uh, about 25 or so? Or? Let's see, what is it? Well, it's 62 uh, kilometers, 62 hundredths of a mile, yeah. say, but uh, two-thirds of 40 would be what, 30-something. Yeah. Now, what kind of food did you have on this march? Uh, a lot of it was just scrounged from uh, the area, like uh, kohlrabi, the, the kohlrabi was grown on these farms. So yeah, that's what, they, what we call rutabaga a lot yeah, of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you a lot could of pull them out of the ground and eat them. Then. Yeah, and then uh, we would get, get some additional food, maybe like a little bread or something like that. But we didn't get much. Did you walk through the countryside then? Or yeah, we walked up? right along through the, the highways through the countryside. What about, were there civilians marching around there, moving out of there too? or were no, you? Uh, uh -uh. You were alone. This, this. Now how many were in this group? Oh gosh, you know, like as I said in this camp, there were about eight thousand people, and uh, I just don't know how many there were. There must have been. No. Uh, Where did you go then? When you started, you say you started. You went to Saxony. Yeah, you ended up in Saxony, and. Uh, what, was that a camp there? No, no. No. Uh, we we. Uh, I think the German goal was to march us to Bavaria, and they planned to make their last stand in Bavaria, and apparently used the POWs for, for bargain, as a bargaining chip when the end came. We didn't make it to Bavaria. We no. ended up at uh, 
town called Halle in Saxony. Yeah. And uh, the American troops were there, and uh, the Germans simply turned us over to the Americans, and that was it. In Saxony? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that was, as far as, that is the end of the war, as far as you were concerned. Uh, yeah, it was the end of April. The war actually didn't end until okay. around, what is it, well, 8th, 8th of May, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but when you got down there, that you say that... Uh, the Germans just turned you over to the Americans. Just there. turned us over to the American troops, sir. Nothing, no, no activity, no fighting or anything. No, 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 no. The Germans realized they had lost the war, so no. there was no fight. What happened to those Germans that turned you? Those guards that were with you. What that? happened to the guards? Yeah. I'm sure they ended up as POWs. Yeah. What, uh, what did the Americans do to you then when they when they got this big? Well, group? they treated us. The first thing is. Uh, uh, they put us in uh, a place where we can get a bath because, you know, we hadn't uh, had a bath in months. No. And uh, gave us some new clothes to you know, repair the, the dirty stuff we're wearing. The, the clothes that we had were Canadian Air Force clothes because uh, the flight uniform I had was confiscated. And yeah. at, uh, at Wetzler, there was given Canadian Army uh, uh, Pants, clothes. shirt, and everything? Yeah, yeah, and even shoes. Even shoes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we were told, you know, there was a, since the Army was uh, in Holly, they had to set up a camp there, and there was a mess hall. We were told, don't go to the mess hall because you can't take the food. I uh, didn't listen to them. I, you know, it, it was so long since I had any uh, real food that I went there and had a meal, threw up. <laughs> it, it didn't, uh, you know, uh, I should have known what, my stomach had shrunk so yeah. I couldn't handle it anymore. And uh, the next problem that came up with is uh, I was in uh, southern Italy, in uh, uh, southern Italy's malaria zone. That and was before you were captured. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we used to take a medicine called Adabrin uh, to uh, prevent uh, from us from getting malaria. Now, Adabrin had an unusual effect of uh, turning the skin yellow. Oh, yeah. And uh, I know when, as soon as I arrived in this camp, one of the men in the room I said, looked at me and said, you've been in Italy, and said, how did you know? And he said, your skin is yellow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I had no problems with malaria in the camp, but was, I think I'd been liberty in only a couple of days and I got malaria. Oh, yeah. I don't know, it was dormant or something like that, but there's no malaria in Germany. Oh. And, but anyway, so I ended up in a, a hospital. I was sent to uh, France. Uh, that American hospital? Yeah, yeah. Well, Army hospital. Army hospital. Yeah. And in Reims, and I was there a couple of weeks, and then uh, I was recovered well enough, so they sent me to Cherbourg on the coast of France. And from there, we went by ship uh, back to uh, the States. We landed. It was a two-week trip, a ship. We ended up in Charleston, South Carolina. And from there, I was sent to Fitzsimmons General Hospital in Colorado by train. That's by Denver there? Yeah, by yeah. Denver. Mm -hmm. Well, now, on this ship that come from uh, Cherbourg or La Havre, yeah. wherever it was. Sh Le Cherbourg. Cherbourg, yeah. Were there a lot of POWs on that oh, ship? Oh, sure, yeah. All of them, maybe, mm -hmm. most of them. Yeah. Did you ever go to Camp oh. Lucky Strike? No. Ever hear of that? Camp Campbell? No. Well, wait a minute, there must have been a name for this camp in Cherbourg, but I don't know what it no, was. No. But anyway, there were a lot of Americans there waiting for a, a, a ship right. to go back to the States. Yeah. Now, how was your health there after the war and you were getting ready to go back to the States? Pretty good? Well, I mean, well, before... Uh, at Cherbourg, we'll say. Yeah. Cherbourg? I could get around. Yeah. You, but, you uh, were starting to gain, gain some weight back? Uh, yeah, I gradually came back. And then you got on this ship at Cherbourg, and where did you go to? Norfolk, you say? Uh, no, uh, Charleston, South oh, Carolina. Oh, Charleston, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they, you left the ship, and what happened then? Well, I was sent to a hospital in uh, uh, oh, yeah. Martin Hospital in Char uh, Charleston. Uh, uh, Charleston, and then from there decided to ship me by train to Fitzsimmons. Charlotte. What is wrong with you then? Why did they send you to the Malaria. hospital? Malaria. What? Malaria. Mm -hmm. Malaria and another thing, ulcers. Officers, yeah. mm -hmm. Now, how long were you there at Fitzsimmons? I was there from, oh gosh, uh, from about June to November. Now, the war was over then? Oh, yeah. In uh, Europe? Uh, I was given a, a break, though, when I was at Fitzsimmons. I think I was there in 
in, until September, and then they let me have a leave to go back and visit my family so I could uh, see them. Yeah. Then I returned to Fitzsimmons, and then finally in November I was discharged. You were, and then you went, where did you go home then to? I went, I went to St. Paul, where my parents were living. What did you do then when you got back to St. Paul there? Uh, well, the first thing I did, uh, two things. One, I got a job because I wanted to go to college and you needed money. I worked for the uh, Railway Mail Service, the same uh, organization that my dad worked for. Uh, also, I was afraid of, you know, the, of there being another war with the Russians. So I studied Russian at the University of Minnesota at night. I worked during that. I worked and also I went to school. I see. Do you study Russian there? Oh, yeah. You know a few words in Russian then? Yeah. Shita kasha pista nasha. Yeah. Cheese and porridge is our food. <laughs> but then also I uh, uh, studied uh, Russian at the University of Colorado. There was a, the, uh, the first teacher I had at the University of Minnesota was from. Uh, uh, he was a German, but he was from. Uh, uh, well, they had uh, there were Germans living in uh, the Baltic states, and he was a Baltic German, oh, I see. so he yeah. knew Russian. Yeah. And then the second teacher here was a real Russian, yeah. a Russian woman now, at the University of Colorado. You got the University of Colorado. That was in Denver, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, no, Boulder, Colorado. Oh, Bo in Boulder. Okay. And then. Uh, did you work anything out there? Did you graduate, or what happened then out well, there? Well, I. Uh, Went to Hamlin University in St. Paul, got my BA degree in uh, economics and Spanish. I studied Spanish too. And uh, while I was at uh, Hamlin University, I was chosen to be an exchange student. So I spent three months in Colombia and South America to study Spanish further and also get to. What year was that about? Uh, 49. 49. Mm -hmm. And I graduated in 1950. 50. With mm -hmm. a master's in. Uh well, no, I graduated in 52, for, no, I graduated from Hamlet, B.A. Oh, yeah. degree in 50, and master's degree in 52. Yeah. After that, I went back to St. Paul, started looking for a job, went to the job service there, and there was a recruiter from uh, the CIA there, and uh, he talked to me, and as a result, I got a job. I think the reason I got a job is I, I knew Russian, and... Uh, so I went to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, worked there for, oh, from, what is it, up until 65, no, up until 67. And at that time, CAA was recruiting individuals to go overseas to Vietnam to... Uh, As the CIA? Uh, yeah, to assist in the... Uh, and the uh, assist the American side in the uh, in the war against the communists. So I went there, and I ended up spending five years in Vietnam. I, with the CIA. With CIA. Yeah. And my uh, job was to monitor the uh, uh, the degree of success that the South Vietnamese government had in controlling its population, and. Uh, I worked in a normal day. We got through about six in the evening, but then I decided I want to get out and meet the people too. So I uh, taught English at night uh, to Vietnamese students. Did you and get paid for that? Uh, volunteer? No, I, I did. Uh, if we did, it was very little, yeah. but it was mostly volunteer. Yeah. And uh, in the course of my experience in Vietnam, I met my wife. She, was was she a uh, she was a citizen of Vietnam. Oh, she, yeah. yeah. She was yeah. born and raised there. Yeah. yeah. I spent, two, uh, spent uh, two years in Saigon, three years in Da Nang, in northern part of South yeah. Vietnam. And that's where I met my wife. We became engaged. Uh, I went back to the States in the summer of 74. She had to uh, do the paperwork to get a uh, visa to come to the U.S. and all the rest of that. And... Uh, and finally it went through so, I, uh, so she could come to the States. So I, went, I flew back to Vietnam on my own and picked her up and came back to the States. And uh, we were married in Minto in February 75. Did you retire from the CIA? Yeah, but this was, I retired in, uh, in uh, actually I left the CIA in 86 and came over to Grafton. Oh, 
Had you did you retire then from the CIA? Yeah, yeah. My, I kept a contract job. I used to go back there and work for maybe a couple of weeks a month up until oh ninety one. And where was that at? In Washington? Or? Yeah, in Washington. I'd fly yeah. back to Washington. In the big CIA headquarters. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's quite a big, pretty big place there. Wasn't sure. You had quite a many thousands. Mm -hmm. Did you have a place to sleep or live there too? Oh yeah. When I uh, well actually, when I was working in Washington, we had a home. Oh. Uh, well, about five or six miles away from where the CIA was located. And then when I went back to a contract status, I had a sleeping room. Yeah. Now, did you, and you retired from that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how has your health been since you left the, the military service, we'll say, or the CIA for that? Uh, well, uh, I should back up that, a, uh, you know, I, although I was an ex-PAW, there was... Uh, 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 back when it was about 15 years ago, they decided they're going to uh, issue a medal to XPOWs. Oh yeah, yeah. I applied for it, and I found that there was no record of, of me being an XPOW. Oh yeah. And uh, finally, you know, uh, I was told that you know the records warehouse in St. Louis had burned down, so they had no record of my uh, being an XPOW. And I thought this is ridiculous. So I uh, went to uh, Senator Burdick's office, and I said. I was still, you know, working in Washington, and I said, uh, uh, "Can you prove, come, come up with some proof that I was an XPW?" Somehow they, they you know, they're able to prove it. And I got a, uh, a statement that I was uh, an XPW. We got the medal, sure. and uh, my health in Washington was good, uh, but with old age and so forth, I've had a number of medical problems, sure. and. Uh, so uh, I'm getting help through the uh, yeah. VA. Any now. operations to speak of? Uh, and so I'm trying to think. Uh, most of the problems I had uh, haven't involved operations. Like oh. one thing, I'm losing my hearing, yeah. and I've got the uh, hearing aids. Yeah. I've also had an eye problem. It's uh, molecular degeneration. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, I had an. Uh, I did have an operation then, but it was laser surgery. Oh yeah. To uh, stop the bleeding in the right yeah. eye, and. Uh, uh, how do you, f how, uh, if you were going to live your life over again now, John, would you maybe do the same thing, or what, would you take another course of action, or? No, I'm satisfied with what yeah. I did. How do you feel that the VA and the government has treated you since? Uh, Fine, I have no complaints. No complaints. Well, the VA is able to, able, uh, able to handle my medical problems yeah. because I'm an ex-POW. Now, you're retired from the CIA. Mm -hmm. You get a check from them each month. Uh, yeah, retirement yeah. check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Now, you get Social Security, too. Uh, now you, uh, they've changed it. Uh, before you used to uh, get only a retirement check from the government, you wouldn't get uh, Social Security yeah. unless you had uh, a civilian job of some yeah. kind. Oh, I see. And then uh, one of the things I did in Washington, I always had a second job of some kind. Yeah. So I accumulated enough credit so I, I get both the uh, uh, government retirement and Social Security. Yeah. Now you can't do it. You just get one check. But that's this was all before, I think they changed it around 86. Yeah. Yeah. But now I had a number of jobs uh, outside of the CIA in Washington. I worked for a department store. I uh, also uh, uh, worked, even uh, spent a year working for McDonald's at night. And uh, I had a number of jobs, so keep What working. Now, uh, what, are you doing any, you do have a job in Grafton now? Uh, yeah, I'm working for Alco, which is a discount store. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Are they on the west side there? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you know where Kmart used to be? Yeah. That's that's where they're located. Uh, pretty good uh, pretty good business there? Uh, there's a lot of competition because it's, you know, Palmyra is the same sort of... Uh, store, yeah. Uh, same sort of store. Yeah. But uh, Elko is coming along, though. Yeah. Now, do you have any children? Yeah. I have one daughter and one granddaughter. What does uh, the daughter do? Where is she living? Uh, the daughter uh, went to school in um, at uh, UND Lake Region. She graduated oh. from there last year. She came back to Grafton. She's a supervisor at the new Cenex store in Grafton. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, she has a daughter who is now one year old. Oh. What about your wife? Does she, is she working anything? In yeah. She uh, worked at uh, Hardy's uh, for about 12 years oh. in Grafton. And then uh, they abolished her job. She went to work for Wally's Bakery in Grafton, and they closed the bakery. 
and she's now working for uh, Hugo's Bakery in Grand Forks. How, as a, as a Vietnam now, how does she feel she's been treated here in the United States? Oh, uh, I mean, generally speaking. Uh, As a foreigner, you know, she lived most of... No, she's, she's had no tro no real trouble. No, no. Uh, the people have accepted her. Yeah. And uh, she's outgoing. She's made friends. Sure. Uh, a lot of people. And uh, she does have relatives in this country now. Uh, her immediate family's in Vietnam, but yeah. she has a cousin and uh, cousin's family in, uh, in Stockton, California, and then uh, an elderly aunt in uh, Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Her uncle died in uh, August, so she traveled from uh, here to uh, Wichita to attend the uncle's funeral. I see, yeah. But, uh, and then uh, things are liberalizing. You can t uh, call, uh, uh, make a long distance call to Vietnam now. Yeah. So she's talked to her mother a couple times. Sure, sure. Now, uh, do you belong to the VA or, I mean, to the American Legion or any of those organizations in uh, I belong to the American Legion, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that Mr. Brazil, he's in charge of the, he's the service officer, isn't he? Yeah, right? yeah. for Walsh County. Mm -hmm. For Walsh County, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, now you were down at Fargo here c within the last week or two, weren't you? Yeah, there was the, uh, a program for XPWs yeah. on the 17th of uh, yeah. September. Yeah, they had yeah. one here at Grant Forks, yeah. too, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I went to that uh, yeah. along with uh, BJ Brazil, yeah. and there must have been about 20 XPWs there. Sure. Well, that's pretty nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But every year the VA hospital does have a program for yeah. XPWs yeah. and also MIAs, yeah. those that didn't return. Now, do you feel that the VA has treated you fairly? Since yes, I, I yeah. have no complaints. Yeah. What do you What do you think about the young people today? You know, those in high school or college compared to the time that you were young in, in college or high school? How do, how do those two groups of people compare? Well, one thing, when I was uh, going, to, you know, got out of high school, the war had started, so most of the young men wanted to get in the military. Yeah. And uh, now there's very little interest in, no. in joining a service. Oh, yeah. How... Uh, how do you think these these if we got into another war? How the how do you think these young people of today would compare with the young people that you were with when World War mm. II started? Uh, I'm afraid wouldn't compare. Would they wouldn't compare favorably? No, because uh, most of them have no interest in the military. Yeah, and. Uh, I think if you know if a war came and we needed more personnel, they'd have to go back to the draft again. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, you do you think that universal military training perhaps is a, is a is something that we should have in this country, where each man gets to go a year or so in the military? Yeah, very definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be right after high school, you know, before they get involved in other yeah. things. Give them a year of military training. Yeah. So then we do have the basis for sure. uh, military personnel if a war came. Yeah. No. Yeah. How is how is your health right now? You're still working right now, you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you work full time or just part time? Or part time. Part time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, my health isn't has been too good because no. uh, I have well, I've got hearing aids, so sure. I can hear, but there are problems there. Yeah. And uh, I still have problems with my eyes. Yeah. And uh, I've got cancer, prostate cancer. You have you ever have you ever uh, had any meetings with those POWs you had with uh, in the war? Any uh, met any of those conventions where they have POWs? I've never gone to a no. national convention. No. So I've never have you ever gone to anywhere they where they have a, a convention? We'll say for the camp, one of the camps you were in. No, no. Mm -hmm. I have, and they were they were. I would like to go. And uh, the trouble is, you know, uh, after I was liberated and then uh, I became sick right after that, I was separated from the people I was with and I never saw them again. No, yeah. One uh, uh, fellow I have kept in contact with is uh, uh, Lloyd Dickinson. He was a good friend of mine and he was on a different plane and was shot down at the same time and he was in, uh, in Barth. Oh. And, uh, one, you know, although the uh, the military did not have a record of me being a POW, the strange thing is I got letters from 
Uh, I got a letter from a man in Slovakia, and another in Czechoslovakia, asking me as an XP to go back and visit them. <laughs> so somehow or another, they got my interest. You got your record straightened out now, have you? I, yeah, I hope so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. They got you on the official record in yeah. VA, mm -hmm. so that's no problem. Well, John, you do you have anything special now that you want to tell the world? No. I, As we kind of close our little meeting here, a little okay, conversation. I, I'll say that uh, one thing that kept me going and uh, while I was a POW in Germany was the fact that I was in Germany and not Japan. Yeah. Well, treatment was far worse. And then uh, I did accomplish a couple things. One, I stopped smoking. Because we couldn't, the only thing we could get later on was uh, Bulgarian and Russian cigarettes that were horrible. And uh, I've also learned to appreciate the people around me. Yeah. And uh, I carry no bitterness toward the Germans. I realized that you know their their government was yeah. uh, was uh, controlling the show, and they had very little say in it. Yeah. I have no desire to go back and visit the POW camp, though. No. Uh, although I, I've seen ads that... Well, I think most of those camps too have been eradicated. There's yeah, all these little plaques. I have no desire to go back and see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, it was nice visiting with you, John. And before you leave now today, we'll give you a tape of this conversation we had. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll give you send you a couple extra in the mail okay. so you can give to your VA counselor there in Walsh County and uh, mm -hmm. to have some other relative of yours and so on because mm -hmm. they'd be glad to hear this. See? Mm -hmm. Now is there anything else you'd like to say John as we close here about this it, about what do you think the world is coming to? Well uh, one thing I want to say I'm grateful that I'm alive because sure. uh, there were only three of us on that aircraft that survived. Yeah. Uh, the uh, world seems to be a better place now than it was, uh, say, 50-some years ago, yeah. because uh, there's no major military force opposing us now. No. Like th there's no Russian threat anymore. Yeah. So how's, how's the CIA doing? Are they building up, or do you have much uh, contact? They're, they're uh, uh, downsizing, they're because downsizing. Uh, the uh, one of the big things in the past was uh, following the activities of the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union is gone. Sure. Uh, the CIA still has a job, though, like one of the big jobs now is, uh, is terrorism. Yeah. But I'll say another thing about the CIA, too. They are interested in getting information on MIAs. So well, they, they are, yeah. yeah. So if, you know, if anybody comes up with the information on MIAs, they, uh, they uh, process it and turn it over to the Pentagon. At the Pentagon, there's an office handling PW, uh, PWs and MIAs. Yeah. By the way, uh, the man in charge of MIAs in the United States, mm -hmm. he's a, a three-star general, or a, what, he's an admiral from mm. Cooperstown. Uh -huh. And he's got maybe two, 3,000 people under him. He's in charge of mm -hmm. trying to figure out who these MIAs are, or where they are, or where mm -hmm. they're buried, and when mm -hmm. they find bones and so mm -hmm. on, he's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. Can't remember what his name is, but he's got a big job and he's quite I met, active I met all over the world. I met him once. I've forgotten his name. Though. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they uh, check uh, burial spots, spots, and mm -hmm. and men and so on, and problems all over the world. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it was nice to to have you here, John. Well, thank you. And I hope you you feel that it's worthwhile for not only for you, but I mean for your daughter and grandchildren mm -hmm. and so on and so forth that'll look at this in years to come and mm -hmm. they'll feel feel proud that you you played a part mm -hmm. in the history of our country mm -hmm. and I think that's that's important mm -hmm. so thanks a lot John. you're welcome yeah. Elmer thank yeah. you for inviting me to come here yeah we're glad to do it yeah mm -hmm.
Oh, what do you know? He smiled at me in my dreams last night. My dreams are getting better all the time. And what do you know? He smiled at me in a different light. My dreams are getting better all the time. 